but we're going to go ahead and get started. And we're going to open up with a word of prayer. We'll get the young people off to their class and we'll go ahead and begin. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for another opportunity to gather together on this digital platform once again to look at your word, to read your word, to discuss your word. And so now we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would empower all those who are participating this morning, that you would empower the instructors, that you would empower the students, that we may glean those things that you intend for us to have, that we may live a better Christian life and be better disciples for you. Have your way in this time together that you may receive the glory. It's in Jesus' name that we pray and we say amen, amen. Well, let me send the young folks off to their class. They can get started. some issues here. Hold on, hold on. Yes. All right, let's try this one more time. Acting crazy. All right, I'm coming, y'all. I don't know what's going on. Technology, you know how it is. It'll work when you want it. All right, y'all should be good now. All right, Marlene, this should be a request for you to join your class. All right, there she goes. All right. All right, good morning, good morning, good morning. Glad to see you all's face. Morning. Morning, morning, morning. So we get ready to get started. Uh, January 16th, 2022. The laws of justice and mercy. So this is our lesson for this uh, virtual church school. And our lesson scripture is Exodus, the 23rd chapter. Our focus scripture is Exodus 23rd chapter, verses 1 through 12. And our key verse for this morning, you shall not follow a majority in wrongdoing. When you bear witness in a lawsuit, you shall not side with the majority so as to pervert justice, nor shall you be partial to the poor in a lawsuit. Exodus chapter 23, verses two and three. And so this is our text for this morning. Uh, Exodus 23, verses 1 through 12, the New Revised Standard Version, as we have been reading throughout our time together here in Virtual Church School. And this is the way that it reads. You shall not spread a false report. You shall not join hands with the wicked to act as a malicious witness. You shall not follow a majority in wrongdoing. When you bear witness in a lawsuit, you shall not side with the majority so as to pervert justice nor shall you be partial to the, to the poor in a lawsuit. When you come upon your enemy's ox or donkey going astray, you shall bring it back. When you see the donkey of one who hates you lying under its burden and you would hold back from setting it free, you must help to set it free. You shall not pervert the justice due to your poor 
due, due to the to your poor and lay lawsuits. Keep far from a false charge and do not kill the innocent and those and the right, for I will not acquit the guilty. You shall not you shall take no bribe, for a bribe blinds the officials and subverts the cause of those who are in the right. You shall not oppress a resident alien. You know the heart of an alien, for you were aliens in the land of Egypt. For six years you shall sow your land and gather in its yield. But the seventh year you shall let it uh, rest and lie fallow, so that the poor of your people may eat. And what they leave, the wild animals may eat. You shall do the same with your vineyard and with your olive or with your olive orchard. Six day you shall do work, but on the seventh day you shall rest, so that your ox and your donkey may have relief, and your homeborn slave and the resident alien may be refreshed. That's our text for this morning. So some key terms that we want to remember or look at this morning is natah. Uh, the, it's a Hebrew word meaning to bend or stretch. Uh, bending the law or stretching the truth is a violation of God's command to testify accurately. Hamas uh, means in Hebrew a uh, violence, unrighteousness, wrong, cruelty, and injustice. And Ava in Hebrew means blind puts out the eyes. And so those are some of our terms this morning that correlate to our lesson. So our introduction. Uh, can you imagine a world where justice is administered equitably? This was God's design for Israel. God commanded that the judicial system from accusations, charges, prosecutions, and verdicts treat everyone fairly. But partiality, false allegations, and ill will were never intended as considerations for Israel's judicial process. Justice included compassionate care of the environment, animals, and servants. So here we are talking about justice once again. And so our introduction uh, leads us to open us up about God's justice and the justice that God wanted to see Israel and, and how through the legal process, how justice should be administered and be equitable. And that was God's design for Israel. And, and, and when we think about the world that we live in right now in our, in our culture and our society, we, um, we know that, that justice, especially for people of color, black people, people of color is not equitable. <laughs> uh, and, 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 so, and so we deal with this, this justice system that is not compassionate. We even deal with a, a, a social structure now that really doesn't care for the environment, doesn't care for animals, doesn't care for those who serve us. When we see how we treat uh, some of the, the um, I don't want to say aliens, that's not the word I'm looking for. Uh, those who come and, and, and find try to find refuge here and do a lot of the jobs that we won't do as Americans. Immigrants. Immigrants, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Plummer. That's the word I'm looking for immigrants. When we see immigrants who come and try to come for a better life and they serve us in a lot of uh, capacities and a lot of uh, areas and, and, and sometimes we don't treat them well. We treat them as less than. And, and so God says that was not his design for his people. That we were to be equitable and that we were to, 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 to give justice, love mercy and walk humbly with our God. That's what he tells us in Micah. Mm -hmm. and, and, so, and so here we are with the backdrop of Israel wow. being challenged to be a just nation. And so, and so we're gonna move on. Um, unless somebody has something they wanna add on there. 
for the opening. We got a lot of background noise. I have to mute somebody here. Somebody uh, could read uh, telling the Bible story for me, if you would. Justice demands specific rules. In this verse, God commands that Israel not spread untrue reports, a word picture based upon the Hebrew understanding. Israel should not pick up a story, take the story with them, and carry the false story to another space. Why? Because a false story, gossip, is sin. Leviticus 19, 16, 2 Corinthians 12, 20, that causes harm to another person. God warns against following the crowd. Whenever anyone in Israel testified in court hearings, that person was to give honest and fair testimony. This rule applied to judges, witnesses, prosecutors, and defendants. In other words, God forbade perjury and God sanctioned fairness. There was to be no Hamas. Decisions were not to be unrighteous or wrong or cruelly unjust. Thank you, Dr. Plummer. Now, when, when we read this, my mind immediately goes to uh, something that's current in our, in our, in our, in our world. Um, when we think about what happened a year ago on January the 6th, and we think about this false story of this stolen election and all this cheating and all this uh, supposed uh, vote vote harvesting and all these things that went on, the, this lie, uh, this false narrative and false story that was told by the former uh, POTUS and, and people uh, grabbed the hold of this false story and they did something that God warned his people about. They began to follow the crowd. And that fall in the crowd caused harm to other people. And, and right here it says, uh, let me see this line right here. It says, uh, Israel should not pick up a story, take the story with them and carry false stories to another space. Why? Because a false story is sin that causes harm to another person. God warns against following the crowd. And, and, and that's what we saw happen on January 6th. We saw people following the crowd behind a false story and people got harmed. Officers lost their lives. One officer lost their lives. One of the protesters, well, I don't want to call it protesters, one of the insurrectionists lost her life. And a lot of others will be locked up and in jail for a small amount of time and some a largest amount of time, but they were they were they were ginned up. They were they were um, excitable because of a lie, a false story, that then allowed them to join the crowd. And because they followed the crowd, they began to put harm on other people. And when you think about your own personal lives. How many times were you part of the crowd? How many times were you in a position of following and causing harm to someone else because you were part of the crowd? That's just something to think about. And, 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 so, and so God says there was to be no violence, no unrighteousness. Our decisions were not to be unrighteous or wrong or cruelly unjust. And, and so as we think about this justice piece as we've been going through this quarter, uh, just, just think about the impact that we can have on the lives of others when we begin to weave false narratives and we begin to act unrighteous and unjustly towards our brothers and our sisters. For whatever reason there may be, whatever justification we may use, and God is challenging us through these, through these lessons of justice, through these lessons about equity, that we become 
truthful, that we become just, that we become righteous like God. And so, and so that's that's part of our challenge uh, as we as we move on in the lesson. Anybody else uh, have anything they want to share about that portion of uh, the text that we read? About false narratives and following the crowd and harming others. All right. Will somebody pick up this next section, please? Uh, Exodus 23, uh, 4 through 5. Thank you much. Exodus 23. Go ahead. Exodus 23, 4 through 5. Twelve tribes joined together as one nation based upon God's covenant. Unity among members did not depend on one's feeling toward another. Therefore, even if one person hated another in Israel, according to God, feelings do not deter offering assistance. Animals provide a family's wealth. Losing an ox or a donkey affected agricultural production and transportation. God placed the responsibility for animal care on everyone living in Israel. It means for Israel, there are no excuses for not taking care of one another's animals. How uh, would Jewish respond if you saw that an enemy needed your sister? All right. I heard <laughs> Sister Bow laugh at the end of that question. <clears throat> so the question's on the, on the table. How would you respond if you saw that an enemy needed your assistance? And so take... Take in mind what, what the writer says, that, that, that God's covenant, unity among the members, did not depend on one's feelings towards one another. Therefore, even if one person hated another in Israel, according to God, feelings do not deter offering assistance. Um, I think I would probably call 911 or call somebody else. I wouldn't try to assist that person by myself because I don't know what the consequence may be. Okay. Now, can, can we all admit that uh, helping your enemy or showing your enemy kindness goes against every fiber of our human nature? Yes. <laughs> I know y'all really spiritual and y'all real saved, so that might not be y'all story, but you know. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's. <laughs> well, I have to, I, I have to put it in a work perspective and, oh, I can't, I'm, I'm not in the right frame, I would say, but if I have to do something for somebody that I know, I, I don't say hate, I just, desperately do not like and <laughs> and I have to help them with something that is work related I have to go ahead and do it because I know it's a job that I'm supposed to do now I don't have I know I don't have the right feeling in my heart that I should have but I still have to do it yeah that's it's, it's tough it's, it's a challenge to, to, to live. God would have us to live. <laughs> Anybody else want to add? It depends on what kind of help they need or what the situation is. I mean, I don't know. I, um, I guess I know that I'm supposed to, regardless if it's my friend or all enemy, um, I'm supposed to help. And I just think it depends on what the situation is. They may need some help for some money. Uh, they may need help getting out of jail. I may ignore them on that account. See, and see, that's interesting. And thank you, Sister uh, Martha, for, for, your, for your answer, your transparency. It's, it's interesting that we as humans will put caveats on stuff. Right. We, we would say, well, if it's this or that, they might be an enemy. I, I might help them in this. But if it's that, I'm not helping them. But God doesn't put a caveat. God says, if your enemy needs help and mm -hmm. you're part of this, this community of Israelites, the expectation is that you help them regardless of your feelings, right. regardless of the caveats that we put. And, and that's hard to live. I mean, I mean yeah. to be honest, that's, that's just tough. And, yes. and so 
So I say that I would pray. I pray I would respond as Jesus commanded us to do in Matthew 5, 40, uh, Matthew 5, uh, 43 and 48. And I'm going I'm to read that for you all. And I know you all are familiar with uh, the fifth chapter of Matthew. We often call it to be attitudes. And so, and so this is what Jesus says about dealing with our enemies. He says, you have heard it. You have, you have heard the law that says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Mm -hmm. But I say, love <laughs> your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Mm -hmm. And that way you will be acting as true children of your father in heaven. For he gives his sunlight to both the evil and the good. And he sends rain on the just and the unjust yeah, yeah. life. Mm -hmm. He says, if you love only those who you love, what reward is that? Right. If even corrupt tax collectors do that much. If you are kind only to your friends, how are you different from anyone else? Even pagans do that. But you are to be perfect, even as your father in heaven is perfect. It's like, come on, Jesus. <laughs> Could you have found something different, please? <laughs> you know who you this is not working. <laughs> it's like, you know who you created? Really? I got it. <laughs> I don't like them. You want me to love them? You want me to help them despite how they treat me? You even want me to pray for them? And, 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 and Jesus and Jesus throws us the challenge as his as his believers to say, hey, this is what equity looks like. This is what justice, this is what true right. love looks like for your for your neighbor. Even if your neighbor is your enemy. Don't mean you gotta have them over to your house for coffee and, and tea. And dinner, but but you don't mean you treat them badly neither. Neither, right? And and and, and that's hard for us because you know we 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 in this eye for eye culture, you know, two for a two. You, you hurt me, I'm gonna hurt you back. You know, I gotta let you know that I'm not some soft walk over here. You, you're just not gonna do anything you want to do to me. And present yourself as a, as opposition to me, and and I suppose to just take it, and, and and I don't I don't think that this this is not as pastor would say this is this is Daryl this is not uh, me exegeting the text this is my own lens I, I don't I don't believe uh, God Jesus Holy Spirit has has called us to be doormats. You've, you've heard me say this before. I, I don't believe that they called us as believers to be walked over and taken advantage of. But but they have but but the Holy Spirit and God and Jesus has called us as his children to love unconditionally. And sometimes love under, unconditionally uh, appears to be as we've been taken advantage of. It, it presents that way. When you decide to, to let some stuff go, it presents that way. Re Reverend Williams? Yes, ma'am. I was going to say, um, as an administrator, you know, staff often um, lack, uh, lash out. Um, and I, I, this is like one of the biggest things that I think I face on a daily basis. And so I kind of, what I've learned to do in it is I just, when, th when situations happen, I have to pray, God, give me the heart, ha have me to have the heart not to uh, take it personally, you know, and to go ahead and help that staff person, you know, in different situations, you know, move forward and not to have that heart and not to look at it as, um, you know, something that they've done to me or that they hate me. Like I try to take, take myself out of the situation, if that makes sense, um, often, because it's easy to, to feel like I become like an enemy. You, you get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. um, and, and so 
it's hard because these these will be the same people who come back to you in a week or two after they've you know done something and then they want something and so i have to take myself out of it and say you know what be the christian have the values keep you know do the right thing and look at it as i'm doing this for god and i'm doing this as testimony mm. um for, for my walk and, and it's hard it's hard i mean yes, it it's is. hard because you you make those you make those hard decisions that people are not happy with um and uh like i said it comes out in different ways you know some people will say to you mean things and some people will do mean things to you so you know but you know sister i don't think that it's 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 because of your position and a lot of times people that are in a higher position you know someone looks at you differently uh so and, and it's, I think that's really what it is. But deep down, I don't think they're looking really at you. I think they're looking more so at your position. And, and Sister Annalise and Sister uh, Dolores, I, I think you both both are correct. But but I think um, an important piece that Sister Annalise has brought up is about taking it personal. If we can separate our emotions from what's happening in this in this interaction with this person that we may see as an enemy or may see us as an enemy, and it, it's, it's, it makes it easier, if that's the right word, easier for us to respond as God would respond. But when we take it as personal injury, it, it puts us on a defensive that we now have to protect ourselves. Mm -hmm. You're not going to do this to me. You're not going to treat me like this. You're not going to talk to me like this. I don't like you anyway. I never really liked you. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And, and, so, and so if you already had that perspective going in, mm -hmm. and then when something happens, and although it may be because you are high position in them or you have authority over them, it becomes personal. And so we respond out of the personal or the flesh instead of responding out of the spirit. And so our challenge is that we respond spiritually and not fleshly. <clears throat> and, and taking ourselves out helps us to respond spiritually because now we're taking ourselves and our flesh out of this and our, and our worldly perspective out of it. And we want to see the situation like God would have us see it. I think that was some great dialogue around that particular question. All right, somebody take this next section, please. Okay, again, God commands that Israel not discriminate against the poor, bringing false, false charges or killing an innocent person. So, God taking action. Whoever accused the innocent would be held guilty by God. A bribe could be especially wicked. In Israel, anyone who took a bribe was in danger of valuing money over the truth, which could blind the person from seeing the truth. Doing types of behavior is not a or stretching the truth to bend the law in one's favor. Hmm. Yeah, so mm, God commands Israel not to discriminate against the poor. I don't know if we learn anything from this Bible in our current world, <laughs> especially for a whole bunch of us running around who claim we are followers of God. And some of us are just, well, all right. I'll leave that commentary alone. Bringing false charges or killing an innocent person. Taking a bribe, valuing money over life, mm -hmm. valuing money over truth. And so God says, we got to be aware of, of, of being engaged in these types of behaviors. And, and I guess I, I see a lot of things politically because I listen to a lot of political talk radio. 
But I mean, this this particular couple paragraphs really really can make me think to to Capitol Hill, to the House, the Senate, uh, to the White House, and the government houses, state houses, and all over where we see uh, how our laws uh, discriminate against the poor. Uh, yesterday, uh, plan uh, the, the the group that uh, Turner belongs to, pastor. Uh, the Prince George's Leadership and Action, I can't remember the, all the initiatives, but they had a gub gubernatorial forum yesterday. And one of the plan's uh, main uh, issues that they want the next governor of Maryland to address is housing, housing in in inequity, uh, the lack of affordable housing. And so that's a discriminatory practice against the poor right here in this county, in Prince George's County, for those of us who live in Prince George's County. You know, and, and, and so how, how, do we, how do we honor God by not uh, castigating the, the poor among us, or those who we deem as poor? How do we not discriminate against them? How, how do we not allow them to have a quality of life that we've been blessed to have. Especially for those who are in power that can do something about it. Those that had the ability to, to, to increase the minimum wage uh, to a livable wage. Or those who have the ability to make set-asides uh, when these developers snatch up all the land that we, open land we seem to have in Prince George's County build two, three, four hundred house complexes. but. Nowhere in there is, is, is a set aside for, for, for lower income people to have the, the dream of home ownership or either just stable housing. And, 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 and so where's the justice in that? When the rich get, and we think about how the rich have, uh, have gotten richer during this whole pandemic, how, how billionaires have, have made more billions over these almost two years of this pandemic when people have been struggling financially and with jobs. And, and so we see all these types of things happening and, and God says, no, that's not part of the justice that I wanted to see for my people. All right, let somebody have something to add. Can somebody take the uh, next section, Exodus 23.9? Israel was not to forget their history. As a previously oppressed people, they knew the degradation and dehumanization involved. Israel was not to treat others as the Egyptians treated them. Instead, they were to display the love of God to foreigners who may feel alienated. What does your past teach you about how to treat other people? Amen. So when I read this, I thought about us. When I say us, you know I mean black folks <laughs> and, and how in, in, in a small segment of our culture, some of us who quote unquote, you see my finger air quotes, who quote unquote make it, we say that we forget where we come from. <laughs> we forget the struggles of the past that were that, that set us up in a position to allow us to quote unquote make it now to, to be a part of this American capitalistic system to say hey I, I, I'm not I'm not lower class I'm I'm upper middle class or I'm upper class I'm rich whatever it may be and it ain't nothing wrong with being those things but God challenged Israel not to forget their history not to forget that you came through some stuff too. And so now is not your opportunity to treat others the way you were treated because now you own the quote unquote, what we say to come up. I live in the gated community now. You know, if you don't live where I live, I ain't really trying to get with you. You, you need to pull yourself up. You need to work hard. What's your problem? I did it. And, 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 and you know how many black successful black folks I've heard grab a hold of that narrative 
who, who came from nothing and praise God that they came from nothing and now they, they're really highly successful. And it, it's almost as if they forget what they came from. And yet they want to treat others the way they were treated before they came up. And, and, so, and so what does your past teach you about how to treat others? As pastor will say, real question. <laughs> Why y'all thinking I'm going to share? I said, my past makes me reflect on the golden rule. We know what the golden rule is. Do unto others what you would have them do unto you. So I should treat people in a way I want to be treated. Mm -hmm. I should treat people in a way that I want to be treated. So anybody got a different uh, perspective on that question? No, I don't have a different perspective, but I realized that um, back at work again, um, you know, I, I still speak to everybody and just like the cleaning people are all Hispanic and everything. And I tell them, I say, good morning or how are you doing or whatever is going on. And the people around me at work would be like, why are you talking to them? And they would actually, a couple of them would actually come to me and say, oh, that one we can't talk to. I can't say anything to them. I'm not allowed. They won't talk back. They can't do anything. And they just said, I appreciate that you at least see us as humans and that you, you know, will at least talk with us and say whatever. I'll say, how's the family doing or anything else like that? But they just, they just said, thank you just for talking to us because some people just won't do it because of what they do, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and, and I bet you some of those people who are in that position were people who, who weren't always where they were. Thank you. I mean, I know lots of people that came up from janitors or anything else like that. And so why would I discriminate against them for their job and what they're doing? Or not see them as human or equal. Right. Anybody else? Reverend Williams, I was going to say that um, I think for me, I try... Um, to be as humble as possible because I um, I grew up in Detroit and I know there's a lot of um, perception of people from Detroit and um, you know Ch Detroit Chicago um, and so I have I was one of those ones who had to work three or four jobs um, and struggled along and so I never I, I don't judge people on it because. Um, I, I had to do what I had to do to get to where I am now. And, you know, even after I got my, um, my, my degree and um, graduated from college, I still was, you know, working two and three jobs. I cleaned people's houses. I worked, you know, fast food. I did it all till I had to get to where I could get, you know, and then I got myself, you know, my uh, master's degree, but I did what I had to do to get where I am. And so I never look down on people or treat people poorly because they work at a restaurant because I've been there. And I, and I, and, and I can remember when I was working those 24 hour grocery stores back in the day before they had 24 hour grocery stores, how I was treated uh, by people um, in different areas where they would say awful things like, well, it doesn't take, you don't have to have a brain to work in these stores. You just run the food over the, you know, over the thing and just charge it, you know, that was kind of like that, or, you know, how I was treated at, you know, working at White Castles or working at McDonald's, and so I, I try to treat everybody fairly, um, because you don't know what people's background is, you don't know where people are at, you know, and, um, and so that's one of the things that I keep in mind. Amen. Yeah, we, I got a similar story too. <laughs> moving here, moving to Maryland almost 33 years ago in this March. Yeah, I was one of those two, two job people and 
with a degree and yeah, had to work two jobs to make it and not much. Yeah, so to, to be at a position I am now, God, God was good and he was, he was, he was uh, just blessing, blessing me and then getting married and blessing our union. And, and so one, one um, I got challenged in this area, not that I, that I ever looked down on people because to be honest, in general, in the black community, we taught not to do that. <laughs> we we taught that you respect everybody. You don't look down on nobody. You don't treat nobody funny, especially other black people. And you know, and doesn't really they black or white, but you don't treat you know. At least that's how I was taught. I'm pretty sure most of you were taught that same principle how to how to treat people. Uh, as they say, on your way up the ladder, you better be careful how you treat people you pass because they might see you uh, as you fall as you know as you pass them as you falling back down. The ladder because sometimes we get to that top of that ladder we fall off and those people you treated badly you won't see them on your way back down as they continue to rise up and, and so yes uh it, it and so i was saying back to i kind of got sidebar but what i was saying is that when i when i was working as a copy technician i was working downtown dc and and, and i was challenged uh one day just by the holy spirit to just just to kind of look at how people would track, pass, and treat those who were homeless. You know, who were panhandling, whatever their condition may be, or whatever they were doing, that people would walk past them and not even acknowledge them, not even speak to them, not even, not even act as if they were human or, or, or they were actually there in their presence. And the Holy Spirit just told me to look at that and, and kind of gauge that. And tell him to say, you don't do that. And so I so after that particular challenge by the Holy Spirit, I made sure that whenever I encountered somebody on the streets that was like that, if I didn't have the wherewithal to help them, I would at least acknowledge that. Say, hey, brother Jesus, how you doing? I wish I could help you. I don't have nothing today. And they would and they would be thankful just for my kindness as acknowledge them as I see hundreds of others walk past them and act like they're not there. And they say, hey, can you help me? Can you help me by hey, hey? And you know, folks just walk on past, like I gotta get to my next meeting, I gotta get to my lunch meeting, or I gotta get to wherever I'm going, and, and treat them as if they're not human. And so, and so. Our past should teach us how to treat people, how to treat others, especially if we've been part of that oppressed and part of that um, that that un, that um, oppressed and and not treated well a uh, segment of our culture. All right, anybody want to uh, read Exodus 23, 10 to twelve for us? And we get close to getting out of here. I will. Thank you. God rested on the seventh day. This set an example for everything God created. Every seven years, God commanded that the nation of Israel rest their land. No plowing, no planting. This seven-year land Sabbath resulted, resulted in the soil becoming more fertile. The poor and animals were able to obtain food from unplanted fields, vineyards, and olive groves. Fruit and crops would lie on top of the ground, enabling those in need to access the excess produce. God directed that every seven days on the Sabbath, everyone and every animal should rest. There was a physical and spiritual blessing in resting. Both body and spirit rejuvenate through rest and worship. What provisions should we make for animals? What should an ideal food program for the poor include? All right. All right. So, so here we here we are talking about uh, provisioning for those around for, for the poor around us, uh, taking care of the land and giving the land a rest that those who are less fortunate in our, in our communities can eat, the animals can eat, and talking about Sabbath rest, that we may rejuvenate our, 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 our spirit. 
All right, and so and so the question is, what what provisions should we make for animals as we relate this to our to our to our Exodus text this morning about justice, including treating animals well? To what provision should we make for animals? We should um, look at the conditions that animals are faced with as far as having adequate food and water. Um, do we have them so they are exposed to it? Or what can we do to make things, conditions more accessible? All right, anybody else want to share? And so I, I simply uh, I responded that we should make an effort to see that animals are treated humanely. E even, even animals that are raised for slaughter and for food, and, and, and even those animals deserve to be treated humanely until they, you know, until they're used for their intended purpose. And, and so even in the, uh, in the meat industry, sometimes animals are kept in poor conditions, treated humanely, inhumanely rather. And then, and so then they're under all the stress and disease, and then they're killed and, and butchered up to be processed so that we can go to the grocery store and, and, and buy that meat. And so now this meat has been stressed, uh, been diseased and, and all these things because just the conditions and so, so that's one perspective, even for 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 uh, industrialized animals that we use for commercial reasons, uh, for food. But then our personal animals uh, should be treated humanely as well. We've seen stories about people who have hoarded dogs and cats and birds and other all type of animals, and these animals are living in these uh, swallow conditions of feces and urine and and malnourished and, and all these things. So we, we should make provisions that animals are treat, treated humanely. Anybody else? All right. What should an ideal food program for the poor include? I think more fruits and vegetables. And when I say um, vegetables, I'm thinking green and leafy vegetables. I mean, when you go when I when you go in the store and you see how much fruits and vegetables cost, um, like strawberries are like four ninety nine for like a you know a carton, um, or if you look at like things like um, kale, kale is expensive, and so I could see where uh, you know if money is tight, you would you would you would spend the money on things that stretch like potatoes or onions or things like that. Um, but I, I would say more vegetables and fruits because uh, vegetables and fruits are, you know, they're rather expensive. I mean, mm -hmm. apples are $2.99, $3.99 a pound, you know? So you walk away, you spend almost $2 for a, a good size apple. Yeah. Um, and I think those things are important because those are where your, your, uh, your vitamins and your minerals are coming in. Um, so and that's my Spend two dollars on an apple, you go to McDonald's and get you two sandwiches for two dollars. Exactly. Like I mean, like I told, I mean, like I totally, I totally see it, you know, yeah, and yeah. I've totally lived it, you know. Um, I I can remember buying lots of you know ramen noodles and stuff like that. Um, but you know, I, I feel like like with my diet now, I try to do a lot more fruits and vegetables, but they're they're expensive. Mm -hmm. Everything going up through this pandemic, too. Oh my God! So I, I said the ideal food program, in my opinion, should contain foods that represent the food pyramid. We all know about the food pyramid. Uh, this would include fresh fruits and vegetables, whole grains, and, and proteins. Uh, proteins that have been uh, have been pumped up with a whole bunch of uh, antibiotics and other stuff to make them grow faster and get plumper and get bigger. But yeah, that's that's what I said. So anybody else? 
and a program that, de that doesn't have an uh, uh, expiration point on it, that a program that, conti that continues to go because Jesus told us that the poor will be with us always. And so a program that's not temporary. All right, Sankofa. Somebody want to read that? We're almost done. I will. In 1864, Rebecca Lee Crumpler overcame prejudice to become the first Black American woman to earn a medical doctor degree. An aunt who worked with sick neighbors inspired Dr. Crumpler's interest in medicine. After the Civil War, she moved to Richmond, Virginia, which she viewed as an opportunity to do real missionary work, providing medical services to freed, formerly enslaved people. Her medical training and work with the Freedmen's Bureau and missionaries afforded her the opportunity to learn about diseases affecting women and children. Amazingly, pre- and post-war bias laws did not stop Dr. Crumpler. God's justice prevailed even in the former Confederate state of Virginia. Amen. And you would think, uh, when, when we think about history, and we talk about the Confederacy and all that went on, for, for this sister to be able to do what she did in, in the midst of this unjust um, set of laws and this unjust structure of our society was at that time for her to still be able to, to operate and move in, in a way that provided justice for her people is, is extraordinary, extraordinary. So our case study, uh, Eric Hipton Holder Jr. served as the United States Attorney General under President Barack Obama. During his tenure, several young black men were killed. Though he was the Attorney General, Holders faced the challenges as black males living in the United States. He shared about one instance where he was stopped by police while on his way to the movies. His crime running down the street with his cousin. His advocate, he advocated for restoration of voting rights for ex-felons and lessening mandatory sentences guidelines, hold the belief in equal treatment under the law. And so he, we we um, are familiar with Eric Holder and his story, and so he he's avid as he begins gets to the highest uh, legal position in our country as the Attorney General. His 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 uh, focus and the way that he ran his post had a lot to do with what he experienced as a young man. And so he brought his, his experience as a young man in, the, in, in this interaction that he had with law enforcement and to how he would administer justice as the leading uh, uh, legal person in the country as the eternal general, as the eternal general. All right, life application and we getting ready to get out of here. God established compassionate justice prior to Israel entering the promised land. The way we treat one another makes a difference. To follow the command of God, we must ensure that we have equitable laws and judicial proceedings. However, in God's sight, justice moves beyond the courtroom to our daily lives. Justice means helping those we dislike and taking care of the poor and tending to the animals. In Genesis 12, I mean, Genesis 1, uh, verse 28, God made humankind the administrators over the fish, birds, and all living creatures. Today's lesson teaches that this responsibility should be done in a manner that gives honor to God. So questions as we close out. What can the church do to promote justice? What can the church do to promote justice? Well, we can do some of the things that, you know, um, they used to do, in which case when something isn't right, you'd be a, a, a center for people to come together and um, or they can even have it as a form somehow where they come and everybody express their views and and have like the debate type thing. And so you can hear each other's opinions or 
or their reasoning. And maybe you can work out whatever the problems may be by just listening to people as humans and understanding their point of views compared to your point of views. Maybe you can come together. All right. Anybody mm -hmm. else? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Remembering that, uh, as, as uh, Michelle was saying, remember that we all belong on this earth together and we're all different kinds of people and we need to get together. We really do different religions, different groups, and also to support those programs that um, even to the, the point of putting up signs putting up, uh, joining the Black Lives Matters uh, kinds of things, as long as it's being done properly. Also teaching, it's the key to all of this justice is to teach the young ones who have not seen or heard what has gone wrong to help them to see where we need to go. But education, I think is one of the key points. So the church needs to be an educator to that end. Amen. I mean, and, and I thought about it from a perspective as um, as not necessarily promoting justice, but but I guess promoting from this from the sense of being involved in justice. So I thought about the AME Church and the history of the AME Church and, and the civil rights movement and how and how a large majority of that movement came out of the church and came out of the and came specifically through the AME Church. That, that we would march and that we would that we would promote that that black folks needed to be uh, treated justly in this country and and I think this is my personal opinion I think a lot of the church especially the black church has kind of got away from this from this justice piece and from being that that um, that irritant to the system that we used to be when it comes to yeah but I uh, are things that happen within the within the culture. All right. How can we honor God's command to make the Sabbath day to make the Sabbath a day of rest and worship? I'm tell y'all this this question challenged me because it really goes against all that we've been indoctrinated to do in our modern culture. Because the Sabbath is not necessarily a day of rest. It's the day that we come to church, we do other things, we worship, but we got a whole bunch of so so how can we honor God's command to make the Sabbath a day of rest and worship? I think this is a challenging one because like when I when I was growing up, like my mother didn't want us to wash clothes. She didn't want us to do nothing. I mean, like if she made a meal, the meal was made like the day before and we went to church, we spent the whole day at church. We did, you know, things like that. And so it's it's hard because I think like in our society now, everything is open on Sunday. It used to be that, you know, businesses were open, you know, like a small segment, one to five or 11 to five. But now, I mean, I mean, even the malls are closing at seven, eight o'clock on 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 um, Sundays. I think the biggest thing is um, if we decide that we're going to set aside a time where we say we're going to go to church, we're going to have our Bible study, we're going to do all these different things and hold that first and not get distracted from everything else. You know, um, and so so even if you let's say you have to go into work, maybe you work, you know, one to five or, you know, after church or let's say if if you have something that you got to do, maybe it's um, maybe it is washing clothes, do it after. So putting God first and having that time set aside to um, worship him and to 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 rest. Yeah, I, I think we, we have to be intentional about carving out that time to, to um, have a Sabbath time. Uh, I know when I when I was going through my program at Princeton that we were looking at world religions and we start when we were looking at Judaism and they began to talk about and they was the instructor was teaching teaching us about the professor was teaching us about the Sabbath. And, you know, I, I had heard about the Sabbath before, but I didn't know much about the Sabbath. And as we got, as we got into this, 
I was kind of blown away about the intentionality that the Jewish believers put into recognizing the Sabbath. They literally don't do anything. I mean, they do as look, I learned that they have what they call Sabbath ovens and Sabbath elevators and, and all these things that if they do have to do something, that is pretty much like automated. So they would put their meals together on that Friday and they would put them in the ovens or whatever they have to do and the ovens will automatically come on or they will hire people to come into their homes to, to do those things for them that they literally would have a day of rest where they would rest and focus on worship for the, for the coming day. They have what they call Sabbath elevators. You all probably know some of this stuff. And basically on the Sabbath elevators, the buttons were already engaged so you wouldn't have to even reach up to push the button because it, because it was the Sabbath. And, and, so, and so they did all these intentional things to honor God's command of a day of rest. And I think I think we need that too, because we always on the go. <laughs> but I mean, the, I mean, in, re, in the reality of, of life, it's, it's rare that we take a rest. And, Reverend Williams, yeah, I agree with you, and also at least um, because the Sabbath used to be, I know, like growing up, um, as she say, you didn't do anything but go to church on Sunday and spend it with, and then spend time with your family. Um, so we have gotten away from that a long ways when they start opening up schools <coughs> Sundays, because it used to be a time you wouldn't find a thing open, not even a gas station. Yeah. And now everything is open. So it's like we never rest, like we're supposed to take that time to rest and rejuvenate our body. Um, and you know, it's supposed to go to, you know, worship service, but um, it was so strange because I think last night on the news after I had studied a Sunday school lesson and they was talking about one of the business or something, they decide now they were not open on Sundays. And I said, we're going to have to get to the point <laughs> after a while that nothing is open on Sundays again so that we can come together and worship God and rest, as he said, you know, because it was like rest the animals and everything, get rest. So this way, the employees will get some rest and be able to worship. So that's what we're going to have to do to come together. All this is going to have to change in this world to go back to like when our ancestors really recognized the Sabbath day. Yeah. Oh, Girl, up in Virginia, okay. we have what they call the blue law. So yeah. It was open mm -hmm. on Sunday. You had to make sure you got your gas, your groceries, whatever you needed that mm -hmm. Saturday. You needed it for Sunday yeah. because there wasn't no running out to the store to get nothing. Right. It was closed. And then they finally changed that blue law because capitalism rules in this country. So mm -hmm. you know, we got to make a dollar. But all right, mm -hmm. I'm going to get off on of another soapbox. But yeah, so <laughs> we, need, we, need to, we need to be intentional. I'm talking to myself too. We need to be intentional about having a day of rest where we can rest and just honor and focus on the worship of God. Something else I wanted to say around that. I can't remember what it was. So the option made it. As it comes back to me. Something says it's the Martha that triggered something. I can't remember what it was. All right, we got to get ready to get off of here so we can prepare for uh, worship. So our summary, uh, contemporary societies often categorize people based on their economic and social status. Unfortunately, this misplaced emphasis results in injustice and overlooking people's needs. Judging, judging people can lead to ava, blindness, eyes that cannot see and give unfair treatment. So we're gonna go ahead and get ready to close out we're going to bring uh, some folks back if they're not already back. So they should be back in a few seconds here. There's Marlena. All right. 
So we like to do a quick o overview of the of the young people so they can give a quick uh, recap of what they discussed today. And then we can have prayer and get out of here. Okay, Reverend Williams, you're expecting me to go? You or a student, whoever, whoever wants to do the, the, the overview or the recap. Okay, um, I'll go ahead and do it real quick. Thank you, Reverend Williams, for allowing me the opportunity. Uh, we focused the young people. We focused on the scripture, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever shall believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And I would like to thank Imani and Marilena. They contributed to the lesson today. And we talked about the many different titles that we call the son. And the son can be referenced in the scriptures as being the Lord, the son of God, Jesus Christ, the redeemer, etc., so forth. And then also we focused on the word belief. Uh, belief being faith, trust, confidence, and knowing uh, as far as that. And we referenced and we said also that we said that, listen, God wants us to believe in Jesus, his son, so that we can have eternal life. And uh, Marilena, I asked Marilena, I said, well, what does perish mean? And Marilena says something that can go bad. And I said, what do you mean? Like a banana that is yellow that can go black? And she said exactly that. Uh, and Imani raised forth one of her favorite scriptures, which was Psalm 41, verse 1. Uh, that talked about the Lord can deliver you from troubles and having faith in the Lord and through these troubling times during the pandemic can, can, can give you faith in the Lord and bring you forward. So trusting in the Lord that he can deliver you. Uh, Marilena brought forth her favorite scripture as being Ephesians 6.10, which referenced strong in the Lord and mighty is his power. And uh, I asked uh, some questions about Marilena as being strong in the Lord. What does it mean to be strong in the Lord? She said to have faith in the Lord. And she referenced that she comes forth to the Lord in prayer and also by writing things down when she has other issues and concerns. So uh, what I like, is I know I kind of just summarized it for them both, but I just thank you for the opportunity. And I like to give Marilena and Imani a strong, just a great pat on the back for today. Awesome, awesome. Thank you, Reverend Young. Thank you, young people. Sound like you all had a great lesson. So we're going to go ahead and ready to close out here. Uh, let us look to the Lord. And so, so one of the things that they asked us to do is to pray for people who have been in prison, pray for police, lawyers, judges, juries, and witnesses as we look at this whole thing about justice. All right, let us pray. Thank you, God, for commending justice, commanding justice. Free us from any bias or animosity we have towards others. Please allow us to display justice towards all in our thinking and our actions and the way we interact with one another, that we may show them the unconditional love of Jesus. It's in Jesus' name that we pray and we say amen, amen. Thank you all. Amen, thank you. Glad to see you all's face once again. Hope to see you uh, next Sunday. Stay warm. Stay out of the condiment snow and rain and have a great Sunday. See you in a few minutes for worship. Yes. Good luck.